So top 10 uh, sins and uh, struggles. Let's, um, let's count down, shall we? Let's count down our top 10 sins and struggles based on the survey given, our survey information uh, given to us uh, by the church. So top 10, starting from the 10 down, laziness, anger, cursing and gossiping, pride, neglecting church, uh, then coping with change, number five, tied at number five, coping with conflict. Tonight we're going to look at number four, easily discouraged. Uh, another struggle issue comes in at the fourth position. Interesting, from 10 down to, uh, to six, uh, the first five are sin issues, and then the five uh, tied at five you know, and, and number four, our struggle issues, that's why it said the sins and struggles, you know, so we're getting some struggle issues here. Uh, before I, uh, you know, we go directly to the issue of easily discouraged or easy discouragement, I, I want to make a comment about the reality of discouragement. Uh, at times, not always, but I've heard this throughout my ministry career, the idea that Christians are kind of immune from being discouraged. Some people think that. You know, your house burns down, you have no insurance, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> You've just been informed that you have cancer, Pfft, nothing to worry about, God won't put anything on me that I can't handle. Your Christian brother has lost his wife and is very depressed. Just get in there and cheer him up. He'll see her in heaven one day. What are you so sad for? <laughs> There's this unhealthy and unbiblical push to deny the very real truth that sometimes life is very sad. Sometimes life is very difficult and sometimes it's very, very discouraging. Of course, you know, we we, we, we want to hope for a better day. We want relief from our sorrows. Who doesn't want a happy ending? But when these are slow in coming or they don't come at all, it's natural to feel discouraged. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can't feel you know, the weight of the world on your shoulders. And some people actually feel guilty because they feel they ought to never feel discouraged as Christians. You know, they're saying to this, well, I'm a Christian, I ought to be better than this. I ought, be, I ought to be able to take this kind of bad news and bounce back. Really? <laughs> Seems to me when I visit people in the hospital and they have cancer, the Christians, you know, they're suffering cancer in exactly the same way that the non-Christians are suffering the cancer. Now their attitude might be different in their hope, but I'm saying the toll that that disease takes on their body is the same. You know, Solomon says that there was a time for everything and that includes discouragement because discouragement is a natural feeling caused by adversity. The key of course is not to allow this feeling to lead us into a loss of faith or a loss of hope, or a loss of, of love for God and for other people. Then it's really sad when the, when the disease or whatever it is robs you of your faith or your hope, robs you of your kind spirit. And then that, that's the real tragedy there. Now if you noticed on the survey we asked people if they were easily discouraged, not just discouraged, easily discouraged. Being easily discouraged is different than simply being discouraged. I'm not just playing, you know, splitting hairs here. There really is a difference. Being discouraged is a feeling that comes with renewed failure or consistent adversity or repeated rejection or loss. It's normal to feel that way. You have a setback at work and your hours are cut just at a time when you're needing more money to take care of some matters and then your child is sick and all of a sudden the doctor says, well, the, he or she's going to need some therapy that's expensive, you know, things, it never rains, but it pours, right? It's normal to feel discouraged. It's like, man, you know, what else is going to go wrong? Being easily discouraged 
however, is becoming negative and unsure at the very first sign of trouble. It's giving up without even making an effort. And that's what I was trying to get to in the survey. These two, they sound the same, but they're really different problems and they require different approaches to resolve them. So let's start with just discouraged, okay? Remember I said there's two. There's discouraged, that issue, easily discouraged, completely different issue. So discouraged. Overcoming discouragement requires less uh, the, adjust, uh, the adjustment of our attitude and more the adjustment of our approach. I mean, it's natural to feel discouraged if we're rejected or we fail at something or we're burdened with too much, you name it, too much work, too many deadlines, too many responsibilities, too much information, too much emotional uh, stimulus. Once told you the story of our son Paul when he was little at Christmas, and you know, you know at Christmas time, some, some Christmases are thin, some are a little thicker, you know, more cash flow or whatever. And there was this one Christmas time where he, we just, there was more money going around and grandma had sent stuff and Uncle Joe sent stuff. You know, so there was a big pile of gifts there for Paul. And of course he's our eldest, he was you know, the first one, so you know, we didn't have all the others there. And he was sitting there with all these presents and he started opening them and he, you know how they are and he, he tore all this stuff open and he had all these gifts and it just went on and on and on and he started to cry. He started, to, why? He was just overstimulated. Well, sometimes there's just too much stuff going on. You know? We want to cry. It doesn't even have to be all bad stuff. So feeling discouraged is our body's way of telling us we may be outmatched. We may be outnumbered. Whatever is before us, is more than we can handle for some reason or other. And the discouragement we feel is our body's way of registering that fact. Now sometimes we have to go a long time before we feel this way. You know, maybe we've gone eight or nine rounds with the project or the illness or the relationship or the problem before we start feeling discouraged. Whatever that is. We're dealing with a relationship issue and things happen and it blows up and you get back together again, you try again, you know, and you say, well, you know, people are human, I made a mistake, I spoke too quickly, you know, blah, blah, blah. But after the seventh blow up, you start asking yourself, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We're not, it, I don't know if it's them or me, but I'm getting a little tired of this. Well, what you're really saying is, I'm becoming discouraged at the potential that this relationship will succeed. And that's a good thing. We, the little light's got to come on at some point. But when it comes, that feeling signals the fact that we may not be winning or succeeding regardless of our best efforts regardless of our best strategy, regardless of our most sincere prayer, this thing is not working. And the feeling of discouragement is the light going on, telling us, hey, <laughs> you need to, something's not right here. So what do you do uh, when you're genuinely and rightfully discouraged by the situation that we, you know, we find ourselves in or we're facing another round with a difficult opponent. How do we deal with discouragement? Well, number one, recommit. In some situations, such as a marriage, for example, or leadership roles, where a deep commitment is made and necessary, some of our problem may be that we're getting shaky in our commitment. And the shakiness of our commitment is affecting our actions, affecting the results of our work or our relationship or whatever it is. Christians, for example, who have a lifetime commitment often become discouraged along the way because they secretly begin to doubt and as a result their commitment wavers and so does their ability to follow Jesus. 
You know, Jesus, how many, you know, when He said to His disciples, are you going to leave me too? When He said, you have to eat this flesh and drink my blood, you know, and, and the Bible says, well, many you know, couldn't take that saying and they left them. Whoa, they, put the, they said, okay, that's it, we're done. We can't follow. Eat your flesh, drink your blood, really? Ooh, no, we're out of here. And then Jesus turned to His apostles and said, are you going to leave me too? What a great answer, eh, Peter says. Lord, where are we going to go? You're the ones that has the word of eternal life. You know, there's, what, what other option do we have? We don't have another option. So you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, do I believe or not? Am I going to follow through or not? Is this till death do us part or not? So many times a recommitment to our core values will send a shot of adrenaline through the entire system which will in turn enable us to succeed where we once failed or give us the strength to accept the situation or the failure that we have encountered in a more positive and hopeful way. You know, the leaders in the church, they exhort us. You know, we offer the invitation, but what's the invitation many times? Other than to come forward and be baptized, many times the, 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 the invitation is to recommit. I've been shaky in my Christianity, or I haven't done my job well in the church, whatever that may be, or I, you know, I haven't been the person I want to be. All these people that come forward or send in cards that say, pray for me, I've not been the Christian you know, that I want to be. What are they saying? I'm recommitting. I'm, I'm recommitting myself to my core value. And what is my core value? Well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He has the words of life. I believe this is the right way to live, despite the fact that I find it difficult at the moment, despite the fact that I may, comp I may be compromised or whatever but I still believe that this is the right way to go and I am recommitting myself through prayer, through confession, whatever. Another way of dealing with natural discouragement, re-examine. Only a fool will continue repeating the same methods when they repeatedly fail. Isn't that the definition of insanity? <laughs> Using the same method over and over and over again and expecting a different result? When we're in the heat of battle, we think, boy, if I just try a little harder, you know, I'm gonna, if I just bear down a little bit more, grit my teeth, try just a little harder. So we exert more pressure, more energy, more willpower, and many times we still fail. And of course, we feel discouraged because of it. Hopefully, before we wear out and burn up all of our resources, discouragement helps us to kind of take a step back and look at ourselves rather than look at our problem. Many times the trouble is with ourselves. The problem is our approach or our solution or our attitude. In other words, you know, the problem's not there, the problem's here. And re-examining helps. Isn't that what counselors do? In marriage counseling, the big task of the counselor, the person giving the counseling, okay, is to help the couple examine their respective roles. When they're in conflict, I'll ask one of the partners, okay, now, you know, I mean, it's, it, you've got to be able to tell the truth. If you're going to counseling, the number one thing is tell the truth. <laughs> Otherwise, you're wasting your money. So the question I ask both partners, I say, okay, I'm going to ask you first, what is it that you have contributed to this problem? And a lot of times, you know, it's, whoa, well, I came here so that person, you could straighten out that person because she's the problem or he's the problem. But when we say that, it demonstrates, well, we sure have not really examined this, this issue very much, <laughs> if that's what you're in counseling for. Counseling is there to help you take a step back and examine the situation anew. So this is a good time to ask for help or go for a second opinion. Solomon said, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. 
The old fashioned way of saying that is that uh, there is wisdom in the multitude of counselors. That's the way I learned that original passage there, Proverbs 15, 22. So how do we deal with discouragement when one, recommit, recommit, and two, re-examine the thing that's discouraging you, the person that's discouraging you, the situation that's discouraging you. Step back, let's take a fresh look at this. And then, I mean, you know, I could make a list of 10, but you know, I kind of keep it to two or three. Relax. <laughs> I, was, I was going for all re's, you know, re-commit, re-examine, and relax. A lot of times our discouragements are, as the great writer once said, much ado about nothing. Tempest in a teapot. We either overreact over small matters or we get run over by a freight train of trouble that we couldn't stop no matter how hard we try. You know, survivor guilt. <laughs> You're both supposed to go to the movies that night and you decide, nah, I don't feel like it. You go, you go, you go, you know, and then you know, that person goes and gets hit by a car and, and dies. I mean, I'm just picking an easy one there. And the other person you know, deals with survivor guilt. That could have been me if I would have went, if I would have said, no, stay home, or if I would have been driving, would have been different, you know, all this survivor guilt, all this discouragement. Either way, we become emotionally exhausted and spiritually spent, leading to that queasy feeling of discouragement. And our fatigue becomes our worst enemy because it makes us unable to deal with other issues, leading to further discouragement. It's not enough, I got this problem now, you know, I've, I've spoken a little too sharply, a little too loudly to my husband or to my daughter, and now we're, <laughs> they're mad at me now. You know, it gets worse. You know, we have to learn to relax. Notice I said we have to learn to relax because relax is a learned thing. It's a learned skill. Here are a few things you know, that you need to know. A lot of times when we think about relax, we think about things we need to do. But in order to really get to be able to relax, you have to know things, not just do things. So here's some things you have to know if you want to learn how to relax as a part of your approach to deal with discouragement. Number one, know when to take a break. Unbroken effort leads to strain and loss of perspective. Allow yourself a time out from your problem, from the challenge, whatever so you can regain your perspective. I tell people who are full-time caregivers, you know, I'm taking care of my 90-year-old mother, I'm taking care of my wife who is disabled or who had a stroke, or I'm, you know what I'm saying, full-time caregiver. Not paid caregiver, there's a difference. I'm talking about a full-time, you got a job or you're a homemaker or whatever it is, and also you're taking care of your sick mom or dad who's down the street or across the town or whatever. You're in charge. A lot of times I tell them, you need to take a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, 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 no. You really need to take a break with people who will not talk to you about how your mother is doing. You need to go find yourself something to do that has nothing to do with caregiving. Go bowling. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Go to a movie, go to a, a, a goofy movie. Do something that will completely take you out of your caregiving role. And make it a rule with the person that you're with that we're not just going to go bowling and in between turns all we're going to talk about is mom and why our brother is not doing more to help. You know what I'm saying? When me, Michael, when I'm behind in my study, I mean, I have targets, right? Wednesday night, a class got to be ready. Sunday, another class has got to be ready and a sermon's got to be ready. I, I don't go get these things at the supermarket. I got to write them. Marty has to write them. 
There's a blank piece of paper right there. You got to, that's, you know. So when I'm behind in my study or my lesson, and, or it's just not coming together properly, sometimes I just, I let it go and I go do something completely different for a while before I come back to it. Jesus often took His disciples away to a quiet spot so that they could recharge. You also have to know your limits, so important. <laughs> every person has a burnout point. It's different for each one, but I guarantee you everybody's got one. Discouragement is a kind of a yellow warning light that you are getting close to your burnout. You're entering burnout territory. So don't extend your limits. It will not help your discouragement, nor will it solve your problems. I'll just try longer. I'll just, you know. And know who's in charge. Much discouragement is the result of human effort without reference to God's presence. The big mistake that we make as Christians is that we don't want to bother God for little things. We want to bother Him for life and death things, but we don't want to bother Him for like the little things. Help me be on time. Help me you know, get this thing through. My wife, Lisa, I always kid her, but she prays for parking spots. <laughs> I said, I'll pray for parking spots. You know, that doesn't work. You know, whoops, and there's a parking spot right next to the handicapped parking spot. And she doesn't say a word, thankfully. She whistles, though. I think that may be a sign of something. You know, we push, we try, we grit our teeth, but the rock of our discouragement just won't move. And yet Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from there, and it'll move, and nothing shall be impossible for you, Matthew 17, uh, 20. So relax and remember to take a break, realizing that you are a weak human being and that in the end, God's will must be done in your life. And so discouragements will come because there's always adversity in life. But when discouragement comes, recommit to your basic core values and beliefs. Re-examine yourself and be ready to try perhaps a new approach or let somebody help you and learn to relax. God is still in charge. He will give you the victory or the courage to live with loss all according to your faith and trust in Him. You see, a lot of times all we pray for is the victory. But sometimes the answer to our prayer is that God will enable us to live with the loss. <laughs> all right, so that's, that's discouragement. We hadn't touched the thing that's in the survey. In the survey, it's easily discouraged. Let's talk about that. Being easily discouraged, a different problem than being discouraged. Discouragement is a natural byproduct of repeated failure on ongoing problems. Easy discouragement has a different source and a different cause. People become easily discouraged because they lack things. All right. First of all, they become easily discouraged because they lack core values and beliefs greater than themselves. For the one who's simply discouraged, I tell them, you know, go back and recommit to your core values. People who give up right away become easily discouraged right away. Usually the problem is they don't have core values or they don't know what their core values are. You see, what enables a person to persevere despite discouragement is usually the fact that they hold to a belief or value system greater than themselves. You know, people die for their country, yes, and, and they die for their ideals, or they'll die to protect their home and their family, uh, or they'll die as a witness of their faith. When discouragement comes, they look to their beliefs and values to sustain them and comfort them and motivate them to, to, to press on. That's you know, people who have core values. In Matthew 13, 1 to 23, Jesus explains this principle in light of the Christian faith using the parable of the sower and the seed. So uh, Matthew 13, 
I have it here on the slide. He says, and Jesus spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. I want you to note that the seed on the rocky places comes up fairly quickly. There's shallow dirt there, so the plant has, a, a kind of a, a, has to break through the surface, but it doesn't have a deep root system. Now watch what he says in verse 20 and 21 when he explains this to his apostles. He says, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. So immediately falling away, what is that? That's easily discouraged give up right away. Why, Jesus says? Well, there's no firm root within. Now in gardening, if the plant has no extensive root system to find water in dry times, it'll just dry up and die. In human terms, the root system is our core system of faith and values, a faith that has broken the surface of our hard, sinful hearts and established itself firmly within us. So people can do the easy stuff of religion. Anybody can do the easy stuff of religion. And what is the easy stuff of religion? Well, you know, uh, uh, going to church, that's the easy stuff. Um, uh, 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 enjoying the fellowship, that's the easy stuff. Uh, hearing the good news that we're going to heaven and having eternal life, that's easy. Receiving ministry, people visiting us when we're sick or helping us, that's the easy stuff. But when the hard stuff comes along, well, what hard stuff? Well, you know, resisting fleshly lusts. Your flesh craves something that it must not have because that's sinful. Or doing the right thing, even if it's going to cost us something. Or serving other people when it's inconvenient to serve those people. Or serving other people that you don't particularly like. Or persevering through difficult trials, yet maintaining a sense of joy, a sense of hope. Someone whose faith is only skin deep. Someone who doesn't base decisions on their convictions about Jesus Christ. This person will become easily discouraged when it becomes difficult. Another reason for easy discouragement, self-reliance. If you're often easily discouraged, one reason may be that you rely on yourself too much. And it's easy to fall in that trap because we here in America constantly hear you know, the success stories the person picks themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, come on, buck up, boy, suck it up, let's do this, get on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we live in, a, in that kind of society, the American society, where you know, we praise people who are self-made men and women. Whenever some story comes along, you know, uh, the one who gets all the praise is the self-made man or woman in business or sports or, or whatever. We live, in that, we live in that culture. But the psalmist says of the Israelites, that group of people, he says, for by their own sword they did not possess the land, and their own arm did not save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your presence, for you favored them. Now, was it, didn't the Israelites have to actually fight those battles with the, the peoples in the land the, you know, that God had given? Yeah, sure. And yet the psalmist says, yes, but it wasn't your proudness at war that won the battle. What won the battle is that God was with you. That's what won the 
the battle. Self-reliance, self-made, self-sufficiency is man's greatest goal and it's also man's greatest delusion. The psalmists put this concept into perspective when speaking of man's position in regards to God in the matter of supplying needs. And I just want to read a couple of these psalms. It says, of God who gives food to all flesh for His loving kindness is everlasting. Who gives food to all flesh? God does. In Psalm 73, 26, it says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. When he says, God is my portion, he's saying, God is my reward. <laughs> the reward of heaven is that I get to be with God. The reward of heaven is I get to be with God without the interference of sin. <laughs> Here I get to be with God, but sin's always getting in the way. Heaven is, I get to be with God always, but sin is, is gone, there is no more sin. So people who have only themselves to rely on, or rely only on human wisdom, quickly lose heart when they realize how puny, how futile human wisdom and human strength really are. Oh, some people may persevere for you know, uh, communism, or they may laugh unrepentingly in the face of death. I'm not afraid of death. You know. But they are simply more deluded than others when they think this way. People who don't know God and His word are easily discouraged when their mask of self-reliance is quickly ripped off by a sudden calamity. God never says this you know, in His word, but He could say it if He wanted to. Not such a big shot now, are you? <laughs> You're not such a big shot now, right? He never says that. He's much too kind. But many times we deserve having that said to us. But not so smart now, are you? <laughs> Number three, people become easily discouraged because they lack values and beliefs greater than self. Uh, self, not discipline, but self-reliance because they rely too much on themselves. And thirdly, they lack focus. They're easily distracted. I go back to Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed in uh, Matthew 13, 22. He says, and the one on, on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Notice that what cost this person his soul was not some great immoral, immorality or a, lack of, or, or, or a lot of adversity. He was simply distracted. He allowed the normal things that clamor for attention to divert his attention from where it should be. Interesting, you know, it says the worry of the world in the Greek there. The word worry or cares in some Bibles comes from a Greek word which means to separate, or to divert, or to distract. In other words, this man in this parable here, he allowed the riches of this world to give him the false impression that they were worthy of his attention. They distracted him. You know, shiny things, beware of shiny things. So the net result was that he became focused on the wrong things and consequently the word and the spirit and the kingdom began to lose its influence and power in him and over him. You know, one of the fruits of the spirit, it, love, joy, peace, you know, kindness, perseverance. Perseverance, that's a spiritual thing. So we're left to conclude that when adversity did come, this man quickly became discouraged in Christ because why? Because he lost his focus, that's why. What do coaches, you know, I, I see Johnny over here say, what do coaches, what are they continually saying to their players? And it doesn't matter what sport it is. Stay focused, stay in the game. <laughs> Pay attention, keep your eye on the ball, whatever, you know. Isn't that the biggest problem? You ever seen little kids, you know, like, four years old, five, play soccer? 
it looks like there's a ball and, there, and bees around the ball. You know? <laughs> Both teams are around the ball. It looks like a scrum. You know? <laughs> or some kid is you know, in the field waiting. You know, he's defense and then all of a sudden he looks around and there's a dandelion there. And all of a sudden, oh, a dandelion. Look at this. You know, and zoom. <laughs> the, the ball goes. Well, we anticipate that from little kids, obviously. But sometimes we're like that in life. We lose our focus. So the danger of so much busyness in the world is that it leads us to distraction. And then distraction ultimately leads us to discouragement. So let's summarize. Heard the bell? Discouragement is normal. It's our emotional alarm that we're fighting a losing battle at times. Number two big idea tonight, there are ways to deal with discouragement. There are things to do in cases of legitimate discouragement. Re-examine your beliefs and reasons. You know, why am I doing this? What's the important stuff? Recommit to valid promises. I gave my word that I would bring this project in and I'm, just, I'm going to bring this project in. And relax, let go, let God work in your life. Big idea number three. Easy discouragement, however, is not normal and is often caused by lack of core values or beliefs or too much self-reliance or distraction. And one other idea. One main thing to do to overcome easy discouragement Focus and stay focused on God's word. It will instill a bedrock faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. People say, I want a strong faith, how do I do that? Keep your nose in the word. Get, you know, develop a daily Bible reading habit. You know, uh, come to Bible class. Keeping our you know, our focus on God's word will reveal His eternal promises that will provide comfort and hope in every time of your life. And it'll help you remain focused and fruitful as you await the return of Jesus Christ. You know, the seed is sown in the honest heart and that honest heart bears fruit. And don't be discouraged because sometimes Jesus said, well, what do you produce? 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. That means that at different times in your life, your, your production is going to be different. Sometimes you do your best, you try your best, and what happens? 30-fold, it's a 30-fold harvest. And sometimes you, know, you, just, you just went to it and tried and boom, a hundred-fold. And sometimes you know, it's not always the same. Don't be discouraged if you don't always hit a home run for the Lord. The important thing is you know, staying in the game. So in this, of course, if this is your problem, easily discouraged, you want to do something concrete to overcome it, as I say, I would say the first step for those who feel discouragement often is to make the commitment to be a regular Bible reader. That's the first step and that step will take you to all the other steps. Okay, that's our class for easy discouragement. Number four, we're almost home. Anybody know what number one is? Yeah, I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> We'll see you next week, if the Lord is willing.